Yes. All right, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Daryl Johnson. I'm Ahmed Wiggins. And we are here on behalf of Emergency Management. And we are here to talk a little bit about uh, your roles and responsibilities <laughs> during emergencies um, and some resources that you have and just basically give you a quick rundown uh, and then also just uh, briefly review the evacuation equipment. We're going to look at a video of how to use the equipment since we're not in a, a building with stairs and we can't you know, go and do it. And then we're going to uh, break out the, the pieces of equipment and uh, let you do a little hands-on touching and getting in and securing and so you get a little bit more of a feel for what, what it would take, okay? So what you're going to see here in a second <laughs> is a slide. Um, and on the left-hand side, uh, there is a pretty looking document that we created, which is a one pager, which are frequently asked questions that we have received from the community, both inpatient and outpatient. There we go. Now you see it. Thanks, Stephanie. Do you want, I'll use that. I just make sure it's going. You can keep going. Okay. Um, so this is the, the document that I'm talking about on the left. And uh, so it has things like, what are code orange and code triage? What are they used for? And it gives you the answers. Uh, what are the levels of activation of the command center? If you didn't know that we have levels of activation associated with code orange and code triage, we do. What is the emergency response guide and how will it help you during an incident? Where do I evacuate once I've left the building? So there's the issue of how do I exit the building? Where are the exits? But then more importantly also is once you're outside of the building, where do you go meet for accountability so that you and your staff know that everybody is accounted for? What is your role and responsibility during a code orange and code triage? So you're gonna, if you don't know what they are, we're gonna review them briefly and then talk about what your role is. And then the last question here is, what is labor pool and how is it activated? We're not gonna touch on all of these. Uh, we're just gonna touch on a few, but you need to know that this document exists. It exists on our Pulse website. We have been passing them out as we do rounds. Um, and the one suggestion that we've, we've taken up from one of your colleagues is that they take this they color it, they, they print it off in color, and in the back of the, th the trifold emergency response guide, that pretty red binder that's hanging on your walls, usually near a nursing station or a, uh, a lounge area, is there's an extra sleeve in the back that hasn't been used, just slip it in there so it's a one-stop shop, okay? All right, so what is a code orange and code triage, and what are they used for? All right, disaster codes, code orange. So code orange, and I'll read specifically from the slide, and I'll elaborate after that. It's a significant internal emergency that in, interrupts normal hospital functions, i.e. loss of oxygen in a situation requiring evacuation of a unit or a loss of electricity. A code triage, any external event that generates uh, multiple casualties and may exceed the capacity of the ED and trauma center. Response is act activated by the emergency department, attending physician, and or the administrator on call in response to a community event that would require activation of the hospital's emergency operations plan. Um, so typically, in a nutshell, code orange is, is, is obviously something that happens internally to the hospital uh, and where and where a code orange needs to be called and the hospital is affected in any way, shape, or form. Um, a couple of examples, I know we, we had some flooding. Um, we had a, a gas leak uh, in, in La Jolla. Uh, things like that will be called for a code orange. And then what will happen from that, from both standpoints, the code orange and the code triage, once they're called, um, the hospital command center will be activated uh, depending upon the location uh, of the incident. So if something were to happen here in, in Hillcrest, uh, we, would, we would call the code, whether it be triage or orange, we would activate the command center. We'll kind of get into your responsibilities and roles in a minute, but does anybody know where the command center is located here in La Jolla? I mean, here in Hillcrest, I'm sorry. Anybody? It's in the, um, it's in the ACR. ACR. Yes. Exactly. ACR. Yes. It's in the ACR. Yes. Um, Administrative conference room. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not usually clearly identified. Uh, so a lot of people, honestly, uh, if you're not familiar with it, really don't really know where it is. But yes, it's in, I think it's room 117 uh, in the ACR, first floor, as you walk into the, uh, into the hospital. Um, Code, the code triage, code triage is something, again, it's external, something that's going on in the community um, that will affect the hospital, uh, whether it be a surge or anything else in which the hospital thinks that it needs to activate. And sometimes it's just not the incident itself. Uh, sometimes the, it, we can activate the command center 
just for um, just to make sure that communication, you know, is 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 is, is going properly up and down uh, the the leadership scale. So it doesn't have to necessarily be the incident, but it it could be a mitigation uh, means or anything like that to help mitigate what's going on or what may possibly uh, be going on. Can you think of any examples of where we actually might plan an activation of the command center for like a code triage, a potential code triage? But what, what would generate that? What, what type of events happen in San Diego? Comic -Con. Like Comic-Con, exactly. Yeah. Or the LGBT parade. Or um, two years ago, I think it was last year, um, when uh, um, commencement speaker for uh, UCSD graduation, Dalai Lama came. So there are certain events that we actually begin to start planning for and have at least the communication aspect and we're working virtually so that if something does arise as a, as a, as a, re as a result of it, we're already one step ahead, okay? Instead of reacting, um, we're, we're actively um, planning for it. Absolutely. And thank you, Daryl, for that. And coupled with that, also any scheduled maintenance that may that could possibly hinder the hospital in any way as if they're working on say uh the is working on computer equipment and that can be detrimental to the hospital then we will activate the command center if they're turning off the chilled water for a specific amount of time or anything like that we also activate or at least virtually activate in which where everyone knows what's going on just in case something was to take place we'll be ready to go all right, so cre code triage scenario. Once a year we have, um, well twice a year we have full scale exercises. And one of those exercises is always built around a patient surge situation. So here's a scenario. The MICN receives notification of a building explosion in a business district. Initial reports state that there are up to 120 patients possible. The MICN reports to the ED and calls a code triage level three moderate. It's initiated at the hospital command center and is also initiated. So, code goes out, level three moderate. There's only four levels, the next one is high. So in a scale of one to four, three's pretty good size. All right, so how are staff contacted? How do you, in your department? Disaster callback list. Disaster callback list, okay. What if staff are on site but they've taken a break? or they've gone off and come back, or coming back? Overhead, Overhead okay. Those are two, two, two ways. I don't know what you guys carry. Some people carry phones, others carry pagers. No, okay. Um, so let me ask you a question then. When you have staff on site, um, and they walk away from the department for whatever reason, bathroom break or, or a break, are you checking in and letting somebody know where you're going? Yes. So another potential way then is a runner, if they know where, they, if they know where you are. Right? Okay. Um, what are the first actions of the trauma staff in this, when you get this information? It's been an explosion in the community. There's potential of a patient surge. You can go to your supervisor, right? If all else fails, if you can't find anybody or, or you, you're too afraid or whatever it is, go to your supervisor and find out what do I need to do? Because you guys are a specialized group, but there are some folks that when a, when a disaster or a critical situation hits, even though you're used to dealing with patients, it's something outside the scope that could potentially impact the patients, all of a sudden they freeze and they forget, and they don't know what to do. So part of our job is to help instill the knowledge so that at least one person is gonna know, oh my God, this is right, this is what I remember hearing, this is what I need to do, okay? And uh, also with that, just the, the hospital command center, I, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but the hospital command center is uh, th their main purpose is to resource what you need, right? So if, if, if there's something that you need that, that you think you may need down the line, then you call and contact the command center, and it's our responsibility to ensure that we're able to provide you what you need in order to do the job that you have to do. So, so n never feel like, um, you know, if something was to happen, that you have to do all the work yourself within the silo of, of your own department. That's not the case. The command center is there to kind of take some of the, take some of the weight off of you, especially as it pertains to resources and things like that um, that, that you may need. So, uh, if for, for instance, if, if, if it's medical supplies or whatever the case may be, um, you call the command center, you tell us what, what you need, 
we can go out to other hospitals or we can go out to the county and we can see if we can get those resources for you. So just just be aware of that if you if you if you wasn't already. That's our that's our purpose as well, and to manage the, the incident, overall incident and to also communicate with you what's going on as well. So it's a two way street as far as communication. You communicate to us and we also communicate to you as well. At least we should be. Yes. So I actually when we had that drill, I remember we ran out of like gurneys, wheelchairs for people that were stable yep. and like blood pressure class. Yep. There was only only have four days. Right. So things like that, we can communicate with you, we need more of this. Absolutely. The way that it's done, real briefly, is we always look internally first before we go outside. Right. Because the way that it works in the, in the tier of emergency management is use your local resources, then you ask your next level, and then you ask your next level. Because if you have resources within, even if it's within the hospital or within other hospitals or the region, they're not going to give you something from outside if you have stuff. Right. Because they may need stuff too. Because this may not just be impacting our hospital. All right, we got to move. Question? Any other questions? Right. Okay. Here we go. So this is the emergency response guide, the pretty red book I was talking about. Um, look around in your area. If you don't have it, you need to reach out um, to emergency management so we can get one installed. But basically, this is your go-to, how-to, 101. This event happened. What do we need to do? Here are the levels of activation I was referring to. So briefly, level one is alert. This is usually just information that goes out. For example, we had a heat wave a few weeks ago, and so our director sent out an email to um, those that needed to know that we're monitoring the situation because the heat may impact our hospitals, and you probably saw the all-user emails that went out about decreasing um, energy usage, right? So that's what that one's for. Level two means that something minor has happened. It's not impacting patient care, but maybe there's a flood in a supply cabinet or a supply room um, that seems to be under control, but now it needs to be elevated to a level three because now it's actually going into patient rooms or exam rooms. And now we need to look at, do we need to move patients? What do we need to do to get it repaired? So on and so forth. And a level four is all boots on the ground. You can see with a level three moderate and a level four major that the command centers will be physically activated versus a level two may or may not, it'll be virtual, and level one again is no. Right, so communication is always happening. Evacuation readiness. All right, so with the with the evacuation piece, uh, we'll briefly talk about it, discuss it, but just know, I, I'm sure you already you already are aware that this changes like all the time. So uh, with all the construction going on, we can we can designate a spot for you on on a map. The next week, the spot is ground is breaking and something's going up. Um, so what we what we pretty much tell uh, departments and things like that, honestly, is um, to use your best judgment and safety and evacuating. Um, if you do have a designated spot, uh, designated uh, on, a, on a map, use it. But if it's not available to you, then at that point, you're going to have to use your best judgment to get it yourself in the area and, in, and, and your patients are, and your staff to ensure that everyone is, everyone is safe. But still, follow the, follow the the evacuation procedures as to accountability, uh, as to uh, try to be try to account for everyone that's in your department and in your care. Your landscape's going to be changing pretty soon. Ours is just getting cleaned up up north. <laughs> okay, so these are the two pieces of equipment. Have you seen it on your floor? Either one of these. Med sled you have? Okay. Walk through your, again, walk through your floor. Make sure that you know where the equipment is. Make sure you know based on what type of incident, what stairway you'd use. You know, this is just basic, you know, when I go into a restaurant, I make sure I know where the exits out of that restaurant are. Because I don't know what's going to happen when I'm in there, right? So I always need to be looking, where would I leave if I needed to leave quickly, all right? Um, so what we're going to do now is we're, because we're not, like I said, in a building, we can't actually go practice dragging people down in the, in the med sled. We're going we're gonna to go through the video so you can see from start to finish, and then we're going to break out the, the, the equipment. But before I do that, are there any questions about anything that we've said so far? I know we're moving quickly. Okay. All right, well, we are going to be the video today. Awesome. <laughs> Is it live or Memorex? It's live. All right, so... This is the striker chair. Um, in, in some of the newer um, facilities, you'll see that it's hanging on the wall with a black bag usually or a, a green bag. Sometimes it's in a, um, a big green uh, metal container uh, over at Jacob's 
the newer ones have that. But the important piece is that when you open up that bin or you take it out of that bag, this is what you're going to have. And it will be, oh, everything's, nope, here, go ahead. No, it's this one. All right. Well, it doesn't want to close right now. That's okay. But yeah, that's okay. Um, it'll be like this when you open it. So then you're just going to pull the seat down, and this will be the condition that it's in. Can you all see? If you can't, I encourage you to come up. All right. So we're just going to briefly review um, the pieces of this chair. This is the striker stair chair. This is going to help you take patients downstairs. There is a cheat sheet on both pieces of equipment. So if it's been a while and you weren't familiar, you could look at this and you could quickly understand what you need to do in order to operate this chair. Okay, so you see red. Everything that red means that you can pull on it and it's going to do something. It's going to activate some piece of the chair. This is for the bar. The pull-up strap is the bar. This is to bring the treads down because the treads are what are going to engage with the steps as you go down the stairwell. You want to make sure that when you engage the treads that you hear it lock. Don't be afraid to, to make sure that you hear that and do it tough because you can imagine what would happen if the treads started to come up as you started to go down. Now all the weight is on you to make sure that chair doesn't go down by itself. Um, oops. Then there's another red one down here, and that's, and, that's for the, and that's for the seat. Additionally, you have these little red locks. They, go ahead. <coughs> for the handles. Ow. And don't do that. Some people use the handles to go down. Other people use the, um, the bar. This one's hard. Don't do what I just did. That hurt. Um, okay, then at the bottom you see the red stoppers. Those are for the brakes. Those are what engage the brakes. You push down, it engages them. You push back up, it takes them back off. Or you can alternatively pick them up. Then there are the bars, then there are the pullouts down here as well. So there's going to be somebody at the top and there's going to be somebody at the bottom. And when you, when you view the video, you'll be able to see what that is. But basically, the chair would be engaged with the stairs. I would be at the top. Ahmed would be down the stair, down a couple of stairs, and he would just simply be guiding. Okay? Additionally, you have seat belts so that you can strap your young friend in. So they'd sit down, you'd open them up, you'd sit down, you'd strap them in, you'd tighten it. Usually you want to go here, but sometimes you go here. It depends on the height of the person and what's comfortable. You want it to be snug, but you don't want it to hurt. Additionally, you have lap straps over the lap. And then you have feet straps as well. So you have three places to be able to secure the person in. And then additionally, if you wanted, there would be a head strap. So if they had trouble um, holding up their own, their own neck or something, you might put this across the strap of the head as well. Okay? And uh, usually with, with, this, with this chair, with the excess uh, straps and whatnot, we usually ball them up and we give it to the, to the patient going down to hold on to. It kind of eases some anxiety to have some in your hand. Uh, as well because there's a lot of anxiety that people have for using this chair. So I would like two volunteers. Awesome. Thank you. I didn't even have to like voluntold. All right. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to strap him in. Make sure that your chair is locked so that your the chair doesn't roll. The, 
while he's strapping them in, just one one more quick safety note as far as that seat is concerned. Um, in dealing with that seat, it it it's supposed to lock in, but oftentimes it doesn't. And what happens is when you take it off the rack, no, the seat across. will just flop under, open under, yeah, under, um, on yeah. you. So um, just just be be mindful of that and, and be careful. It's done it to me uh, quite a bit um, because for whatever reason, that locking mechanism on that seat doesn't work very well. Okay, his feet. Don't forget his feet. <laughs> the other thing, that, the other thing, you guys probably know this better than we do, but the other thing is to tell what, tell the person what's happening, what you're doing, so they know what to expect. Okay, put your feet on the bar. There you go. Okay. So you can stay there. I'm gonna turn to the side. I like. They're locked, yeah. So, basically, if if he was if he was one of those troublemakers, I would strap his head in. Yeah. yeah. So we're not. All right. So we're good. So typically, what, what we would do is I'll I'll pull this out. I will get him to the mid to, to the midpoint of the of the stairwell. I will have you come around. I will ask you to pull those pull it out. And uh, what I'll basically do is ask you. Are you ready? All you have to do is, 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 nest, is just guide. I'm going to pull them back, and then we're going to just walk them down. And as, as you can see, the the uh, the tracks will catch onto the stairs, and it's like a I mean, it stops your cold turkey. I mean, we can let him go on the stairs, and, and he wouldn't move. Um, and then it's just guiding him down, just guiding him down, guiding him down, guiding him down. And then you just let the treads do the work. Yeah. Like gravity. So, yeah, that, that's it. That's it. And then once you get to the bottom, pull them up, put everything back, slide that back in. And um, as you can see, it's very easy to maneuver. Uh, the, 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 the weight on it is 200 pounds for uh, single person use for manufacturer and 500 pounds for two person use. But, I, but I, I, would, I would advise always, two people always do it. Um, a question I got from nurse residency the last week was, um, what do you do uh, if you're on the 10th floor? You have to take somebody down to the first floor. Well, hopefully you won't be doing it by yourself. Um, and, and also, hopefully, you will, someone would have got the idea to start some type of a chain to just pass people off instead of having one or two, or two people go down the stairs in order to get them down. So those are some things you just have to consider. Uh, ask for help uh, when you need it or if you need it, um, and then just try to look at the, uh, try to take it out or, or watch the video once a quarter to kind of familiarize yourself with it. You still trapped in here? We're going to leave him in here for now. <laughs> you got let, 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 photos let, let, why don't you whirl them around so you can see how easy it is. During the, yeah, go for a during the April drill, we did, um, we did a two-part drill, and the first part of the drill was uh, focused on evacuation, and we had three units here, I believe, and three in La Jolla. And the 11th floor was one of those units, and they evacuated all the way down. They didn't think they could do it. We pushed them, they did it, and they found out, wow, this wasn't as difficult as I thought. I learned a lot, and they got really excited, and now they're really actively training all their staff. So great. Give her give her colleagues a round. Huh? Eight minutes. Okay. Just pull it out, I guess. Thank you. Sorry. All right, no problem. Real quick, next leg. Anybody's favorite. Has anybody ever used it? Has anybody ever seen it pulled out? <laughs> This is the handy dandy mess lid, as you see on the on the screen. What I'm going to do is, sorry about that. Oh, here. I'm going to go to the I'm going to go to the screen and kind of talk through it right quick because it's already opened here, right? So basically, um, feet go here, head at the top by the by the uh, by the by the carabiner. You have three straps here, um, and and in essence, what you're doing is you're putting you're putting the patient inside, uh, and you're going to make him or her a taco. Basically, that's what it is, right? <laughs> so, first taco up.
We got them inside, depending upon the size of the person. Um, because obviously some people, some of us are bigger than others. I have no problem filling it out, other of you may. So, if you're a small person, you're going to shift and slide. We don't want that to happen. So what you can use to make it as comfortable as possible for the person is stuff with pillows and blankets all along the sides and the back so that they're kind of snug inside. Um, so you want to begin to strap, use the straps to uh, strap them in. You want to strap them in as tight as possible. Um, Cause this is a scary ride going down. So you want to strap them in as tight as as tight as you can, um, using the straps here with the with with, with the uh, the feet here. You want to when to latch it onto and tack, and and also strap this as tight as you can as well. What you don't see is the uh, is the line that attaches to the carabiner and which you would use to uh, to go down the stairwell. And with that, you would you would attach the carabiner to a a secure um, location or spot, something where it can't slide back and forth where you may lose control of the person, right? So um, usually two to three people, depending on what you think you can hold on to, will one person will be on the uh, on the feet, get them down to the uh, to the stairs. You will actually let them kind of dangle on the stairs. It's kind of where you want to get them to. You want to get them typically to the right side. Let, let them dangle, and then you want to go hand over hand, not letting it slide through your fingers because you can get burned pretty good uh, with it. Hand over hand, in unison, sliding down as the person as the person on the feet begins to kind of just really just guiding down, and then and then grabbing the person, and then moving them on to the next stairwell. Um, if you, if you're gonna mess around with it later on, um, I'll stop there. If you have any questions, anybody, comments, Daryl. The video is great. Um, Stephanie, do you have the links to those? Um, no. no. What we'll do is when we get back to the offices, I'll send those links. I think the med sled is about 10 minutes and the other one is less than that. Um, but hopefully you'll get a better idea by watching the video based on what we've said. You can't just listen to us obviously alone. Um, so any questions about anything related or unrelated to what we talked to today that I could potentially answer? No? All right, well, we have a few parting gifts for you. We thank you for inviting us and giving us some of your time today, and we look forward to seeing you around the hospital. <laughs>